Hey, Jeff, thank you for joining us. How are you? Hey, Stephen, I'm doing okay. I don't know if you guys can hear it. There's like someone just decided to do construction in my neighborhood. So I'm slightly deafened, but hopefully I'll be <laughs> legible. There's not much I can do about it. I think even if I ran out and started screaming at people, it wouldn't do any good. So, oh, there do that. Are. That'd be entertaining. <laughs> Um, no, yeah. I mean, we can hear you loud and clear, so don't okay, worry okay. at all that you're coming through loud okay. and clear. But uh, Jeff, there's been a massive response to that Netflix documentary. Um, you've been very busy as a result. Uh, maybe before we get into the specifics of that, you can just let people know who you are. How would you describe your occupation and, and what takes up the majority of your time? I call myself a science journalist. Uh, that seems to be a pretty broad mandate. I, I, I write about... Um, various topics. Aviation is a big one. I also write about health and just kind of general science topics and, and other things as well. Um, but I, I'm a private pilot. I fly planes for fun. And like a lot of pilots, when I got my, uh, when I was doing my training, I developed an interest in accident reports. Uh, you know, you want to try to figure out how not to get killed. And so, um, you know, when you, you start to read them, you see patterns. You're like, okay, I'm going to try not to do that stall on landing for instance um and so i i got into um writing about accidents and i wrote a, a fair bit about air france 447 which was the biggest aviation mystery i would say prior to ma370 and when ma370 happened it seemed kind of it had some eerie echoes with that one as well well, I mean, what, why the fascination with MH370 now? I mean, everyone, I mean, as the years have gone by, the fascination with it seems to grow and grow. Why is everyone so interested, do you feel? It's been, I think it's been nine years now, hasn't it? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if, if interest has been growing. I mean, it was fantastically uh, a phenomenon when it first happened. People were absolutely gobsmacked. And it was just, it was a strange um, incident, just the way it unfolded, if you recall, you know, it, it, the initial reports, well, it has disappeared from radar. It had vanished from the air traffic controller's radar screens. And then a few days later, the Malaysian authorities said, oh, by the way, we saw it. It didn't crash as we initially assumed. It actually turned around and kept flying, flew back over the country, over even an Air Force base, kept going. And then it disappeared over the Indian Sea. And then, again, and then another shoot dropped. And then it turns out that not only did it not crash there either, it had continued flying for another six hours and it all we have to trace it is this mysterious communications data that we've never seen anything like it before. We have to develop a whole new kind of math to try to figure out what it means. So at the time it was just like this crazy like soap opera of one thing happening after another. Um, yeah. And it sort of faded eventually, you know, they, they tried to look for it in the Southern Indian Ocean, they didn't find it. Um, and then it kind of just faded out. And from time to time, you would have like a documentary kind of summarizing what the sort of general consensus was. And it faded out. And, but it has been remarkable that this Netflix documentary has kind of caused a stir. It was the second most watched show in the world on Netflix the week that it came out. And I just have heard anecdotally that people were kind of fascinated and talking about it with their friends. But I think it's, yeah. I think it's, I think it's down to the quality of the production. The fact that, you know, they had reached out to me some years ago. The whole production was delayed by COVID. I've been talking to them for years and I've been trying to, I said, I tried to explain to them, look, every documentary before this has been rubbish. Don't make a rubbish documentary. Take your time, slow down. It's a very peculiar case. It needs to be looked at carefully. The devil is in the details. If you just gloss over the inconvenient bits, you're going to miss the whole point of it. We have to try to explain these very strange things that happen. And the things, the, the things that happened that were strange were also very technical. It can it kind of take a bit of patience to explain why it was so weird. Um, but I think they, and, and listen, even as, the, as, as it turned out, I think it was a very high quality production, but they had to, for the sake of fitting it all into, a, uh, I think it was four hours of television, they had to condense and they had to summarize and they, and they did have to gloss over things a little bit. But I think they got, a, they, they got across the essence of the mystery, which is that there are no good explanations. This is very uncomfortable for people to hear. People love to hear a satisfying explanation. You'll constantly hear people invoke Occam's razor. The best explanation is the simplest. We have been told this our entire lives. So when someone comes up with a complicated theory, like the one I, pre I present two that are both kind of complicated, one is even more complicated than the other, people recoil at that. It even makes them angry. And they write me nasty emails and say things about me on Twitter. 
But unfortunately, that's just the nature of the game. It's, it is a very technically complicated story. For sure. And I suppose, I mean, I watched it the whole four hours and it kept me, um, you know, I had my full attention. Um, it was strangely entertaining. I'm not sure if that's the right way to describe it, but I suppose they are formatted in, in a way to be that as well. Uh, but is it is it possible that perhaps the documentary just raised more questions than it answered? We, you know, I mean, you mentioned Occam's Razor there, obviously, but it feels like some people may have had an idea of what happened, obviously a simple explanation, and then watching the documentary, they've now got several other theories in their mind, and it may have just complicated the whole matter even further. Well, I don't know if you can complicate a situation that like going into it, I think the state of affairs before this documentary came out was just mass confusion. Like a ton of people had come out with these claims. The, the general media had made no attempt to sort of sort through them and figure out what was what. And what I said to the producers was, look, we can clear away the fog. There's things that we know and there's things that we can sort of rule out basically. And let's try to clarify what we know and what we don't know. And even though at the end of it, we're not going to hand you the plane. We don't know where the plane is, but we can tell you what the possibilities are. And so I think the important thing to get across is A, that there are a limited number of different scenarios that people have can have come up with that to some degree match the evidence that we have. Um, and that the possibilities are limited, but they, all of them are strange. Now, there are a number of theories that are kind of mooted in the course of the documentary. There's really three main ones. And they represent the three different approaches you can take to the, the whole mystery, which is that you can either assume that all of the evidence that we got, including these mysterious signals received from the plane, are exactly what they seem to be. That there was no hanky-panky, um, everyone involved in this, like whether they were you know, mass murder or suicidal, or not, just didn't really have any particular insight into the nature of the systems and so couldn't have um, tried to fool with them. The second possibility is quite simply that someone did fool with the data, that they, there, there was a way, there, it turned out, if you look at the, at the way that the plane was configured and the satellite system was configured, there was actually a backdoor. There was a mechanism by which an extremely sophisticated attacker, and I emphasize extremely sophisticated, could have um, manipulated the data that was being generated by this particular device on board the plane and made it look like it was the plane was going south and actually went north. Okay, that's, how could they? How could they have done that? By by what mechanism? So the um, the the plane had a, um, a satellite communication system uh, that. Uh, involved a box called the satellite data unit, which sits uh, atop the plane towards the back. And this is communicating with a satellite that's over the Indian Ocean. And as the plane is flying around, it is adjusting the frequency that it's transmitting at. The reason it does that is because Inmarsat has been allocated a frequency band that it's allowed to use. And because of what's called the Doppler effect, as the plane moves around, it changes the frequency it broadcasts out. So the box has to do something called Doppler precompensation. Now, already I've probably lost 90% of the listeners talking about this, but this is the kind of detail you have to talk about to really understand what's happening. This Doppler precompensation mechanism in this particular plane, not in all planes, but in this particular one, was calculated using an algorithm. So what it would do was it would, it would get um, navigational data from the front of the plane. Where, it, where am I? How fast am I moving? Where am I in relation to the satellite? And it would take that information and it would calculate how much it should change the frequency. Now, because things were a little wonky on this particular set of circumstances, the, the particular satellite that it was communicating with had started to run out of fuel. So it was wobbling in orbit. It wasn't designed to do this, but it wound up doing this because the, the company that owned the satellite hadn't spent the money to replace the, the, the satellites. It was kind of um, beyond its design uh, limitation date. So because of all this, as I said, it's very technical in nature, but because of this, it created actually, it's sort of this navigational information leaked into a signal that wasn't supposed to contain any. And it took, it took the scientists at Inmarsat a little while to figure out that this was all going on and then to figure out how they could use math to basically extract that navigational information. And so basically what I did, what I was able to determine 
was that you could alter um, by physically manipulating this box, you could change the algorithm such that it made it look like it was going south when it was really going up. It's a subtle attack. Um, and if it was if it was exploited, it would have been what we call a zero day hack, meaning it was it was a vulnerability that was exploited before the owner of the system knew that it existed. And frankly, when I raised this possibility back in 2014, the response of Inmarsat was, yeah, nobody could have outsmarted us like that. Like, we're basically the smartest guys that there are. No, it would, somebody would have to have been smarter than us to carry out this attack. And, I've, and, and that, is, that has remained sort of the, the essence of their resistance to my proposal, which is to say, it's, it's too outlandish, nobody could have done that. And I just think that's a very dangerous attitude to take when it comes to security. We've seen you know, the Stuxnet hack, we've seen masses of Russian hacks against various um, political opponents um, and financial hacks um, carried out by sophisticated hackers. You know, we know that there are um, certain players who are able to hack iPhones, you know, um, that no one else can figure out how to do. So to say that like no one, that my system is cannot be um, targeted in this way, I think it's just a very dangerous thing to say. So it's it's more a hypothesis. It's a possibility. It's a potentiality. Oh, yes. But the, there's no direct evidence that actually took place as of yet. But it, it's it's a possibility. Is is what your position is? Exactly. I mean, I'm not saying that this that I believe that this happened. I'm saying that this possibility exists. I'm saying that this is a way that basically you can create a story that explains the data that we have in hand. For instance, it explains why this box, which had been turned off, was then turned on again shortly after the plane left Malaysian radar coverage. Now, this is a big mystery that really, if you think that the pilot just sort of naively in an attempt to kill himself and all of his passengers and crew, turned this plane south, like there's no reason to think that he would do this. There's no reason to think that he would know how to do this. So he really had neither the opportunity nor the motive to carry out this um, like a, a an act that requires a certain amount of sophistication in terms of knowing about how the electrical system works um and which is to me the core element of the mystery and i talk about I just, when we started talking i said look it, there's a lot of strange details about this that a lot of people just paper over and say well you know i don't know the answer forget about it to me you can't really do that it's not fair to take the most difficult to explain aspect of this entire case and just wave your hand and say, I don't know. Um, and so the third part, you know, the third, you know, I think even calling it a theory is maybe giving it too much credit, but the third hypothesis that is mooted in this documentary is the idea that the entire thing is a fake, that Britain and the United States are in cahoots, the, all the Inmarsat data was just fake, the whole thing is a fake, the plane didn't, didn't fly for six hours, basically the, they just shot it down and the whole thing was a massive cover up. That I think is just once you get to that level of of just not believing in anything, you're essentially giving up because you can't because there's no there's no more theories. If there, if you have no evidence that you can trust, you're you're lost. So I I, I resist that kind of approach. Okay, well I mean you you referenced uh, a few moments ago the the sort of response online and the commentary there, and it's it's impossible to get genuine feedback online. Unfortunately, I'm sure if you, we glanced over it, we'd see people celebrating your your contribution to the documentary. We'd find people dismissing you as a conspiracy theorist. And I right. just wonder, in in terms of getting a, a a metric, if you had any sort of feedback from the the family of the people who are who are missing. I mean, uh, uh, it's uh, there's lots of scrutiny and discussion and documentaries but at the center of this is a very human and tragic story about people who have lost loved ones i was wondering have any of those people attempted to make contact with you and, and talk to you at all no i mean from time to time in the past i have had various exchanges with with family members of the vanished um i i look i feel for them um, I feel that they, most of all, at this point, want answers. I, I, one of the attacks that, that people um, make against me is, oh, I'm like hurting the feelings of the family members. I mean, they want answers. They, they want to solve this. Um, and I, some people say, oh, it's disrespectful to float these conspiracy theories. It's like I'm trying to explain to people the complicated evidence that we have. 
Hope you're enjoying this podcast. There's a word from our sponsor, Rocket Money. The other day, I had to cancel free Amazon Prime memberships. I had a personal on the UK, Amazon, US, Amazon, company account, US, Amazon, UK, Amazon. Do you understand how hard it is to cancel these bloody things? That's why Rocket Money makes these things so much easier, formerly known as Truebill. The app shows all your subscriptions in one place and cancels what you don't want for you. Rocket Money can even find subscriptions you didn't know you were paying for. Just like with me, with my four Amazon Prime memberships, you may find out you've been at least double charged for a subscription. To cancel a subscription, all you've got to do is press cancel and Rocket Money takes care of the rest. Get rid of useless subscriptions with Rocket Money now. Go to rocketmoney.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N. Seriously, it could save you hundreds per year. That's rocketmoney.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N. Thank you for supporting our sponsor, Rocket Money. Links in the description box. Cheers. And you may not like the story that I'm telling you, but the story I'm telling you is based on facts. You might interpret those facts differently than I have proposed. I, you know, I, in this course of this documentary, explain there's the pilot suicide theory and there's the hijack North theory. Those are the only two hypotheses that anyone's been able to come up with that at any degree match what happened. I mean, that's pretty much anyone's really talked about for the last eight years. Now, to be fair, this pilot suicide is like pretty much everyone except me. It's by far the most popular theory. I think there's massive holes in it. Well, um, yeah. I'd love to go through some of those holes with you, actually, sure. because that that's quite sure. a compelling um, theory. It's obviously deeply, deeply unfair if it's untrue, the thing of being pointed at this one individual who's no longer here to defend himself. So what, what are some of them holes? What do we know about the pilot specifically that would lead you to reject this idea of a sort of murder suicide the documentary spends a fair bit of time kind of reviewing his character and like what his the people who knew him said about him and to, to try to make the claim from a character standpoint that he isn't the sort of guy that would do something like that i personally while i understand that approach i don't think it's a very strong approach because i think people surprise us all the time yeah. You know, it's like such a common trope of like, oh, the killer, the killer who gun, gunned down all these kids. I, he seemed like a nice guy. Such I, a nice, you know, quiet guy. <laughs> such a nice, quiet guy to spend all his time polishing his collection of knives. Why? Who thought he'd do this? <laughs> um, so I find that a lot, a little, I mean, even though it's, I sort of agree with the conclusion, I, I feel like it's a weak approach. I, I prefer to say, look, let's look at a couple of things and try to figure out how this jibes with the pilot suicide. First of all, like, as, as I said, this, this box called the satellite data unit was turned off and back on again in a, in a, in a time frame that allowed it to create these signals that convinced everyone that the plane went south without any corroborating information. I mean, the plane had flown over uh, to a patch of ocean that it could then, you know, fly south and like nobody would know it. It would see it. It would just it would be like a hopeless case to, to, to find it. Um, and so. As I said, most I've talked to a lot of 777 pilots. None of them had ever heard of a thing called the satellite data unit before this tragedy happened. None of them knew how to turn it off and turn it back on again. I just, you know, since the documentary aired, various pilots have reached out to me and I always ask them, how would you do this? How, you know, there's certain, there are certain ways you can power it off and power it on again. There's no switch, but you can sort of isolate the entire part of the electrical system. And pilots always tell me the same thing. You would never do that. And so, so again, that is a it's a, it's a it's a kind of arcane and obscure clue, but to my mind, a very important one. This thing happened upon which the entire mystery turned, and nobody can ex can give a, a simple explanation for how it happened. That's number one. Number two, it's a huge, huge problem that the seabed was searched and no plane was found. Um, the 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 data that was used to generate the search area. It doesn't work like GPS. It doesn't give you a latitude and a longitude. Basically, what it does is um, you can create um, a flight path and then check to see whether it matches that data or not. So what they wound up doing was creating million, program the computer to make millions of flights with random turns at random speeds and everything. And you kind of uh, choose the ones that work the best. And what happens is you wind up with a kind of a probabilistic heat map. 
that tells you where this thing was most likely to have gone. And you can kind of say, okay, there's a 70% chance it was within this area. There's a 95% chance it's with this area, 97. And so basically they searched it out to 97% and it wasn't there. And so they expanded it and they searched some more and it wasn't there and it wasn't there. And they basically finally gave up. And in the final report that Australia issued, they said, well, we did our best. We did the calculations. There's no way we're wrong. Our math is good. And we don't, we don't really know why it's not in this area. It must be in this other area that's a little bit further to the north that we just didn't have the time or the money to search. But it has to definitely be there. Goodbye. Um, and then, and so I was like, okay, well, they didn't, they didn't fail. They just, just didn't look in the right place. So it's not their fault. Well, then, much to everyone's surprise, this private company came out of nowhere. It's, it's called Ocean Affinity. And they said, we have this new technology we're developing, and we're going to search this for free. If you if we find it, then the Malaysian government can pay us. Otherwise, we're just going to do it for free. So they actually searched this area where the Australians said, we definitely know it has to be here. And it wasn't there. And so for every area of the ocean that hasn't been searched yet, you have to tell a story. Like how, like tell, give me a flight path that winds up in that area. And the flight path that you'll generate will be kind of crazy. It will like involve flying, like, like making random turns and like, random speed changes, or maybe it did fly fast and straight as the original calculations indicated. And it like fell into a crack. Like there was a crevice in the ocean and it like fell in there. Um, the, you know, it, it would be like just a, like a million to one bad luck, but that's their only explanation. So basically for the pilot um, suicide scenario to work, I think what a lot of people don't understand is that if the pilot took it a whole bunch of incredibly improbable things had to happen from him, like flipping switches at random that, that wound up with this, you know, these signals being sent to, um, you know, the plane, like him taking these like really crazy maneuvers just at random. And then the plane, like looking like it wound up in one area, but it actually wound up in an area. It's not impossible, but you know what it's like, then I've, I've, I've spent the last eight years trying to think of an analogy for this. And I think that the, the Simplest one I've come up with is, imagine that you see a guy walk up to a locker and there's a combo lock and he pulls it open and it, and, it, and it opens. There's two possibilities. Either the combo lock was unlocked or he knew the combination or he just randomly flipped the dials and it opened, right? So basically we're at the state of this investigation where he didn't know the combination uh, and he and it wasn't unlocked, but he just got lucky. He must've just gotten lucky. He must've opened a combo lock just by chance. And this is why the the, the, the Australian authorities who, who think that there's a 0% chance that my hacking attack theory could be right. And also are convinced that they did their math right. They're like very frustrated because they're like, damn, this guy just flicked the, 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 um, the, the combo on the lock and it opened. Like that's how they, they think they just got really, really unlucky. I mean, I suppose one of the, the, the main issues we have really is like, I think it, most people typically struggle to comprehend size, you know, scale and, and time once it reaches a certain level. And we have that issue with the ocean. I don't think people particularly, many people, should I say, don't particularly re realize how vast it is, how deep it is. And the, I mean, there's a possibility really that, I mean, this plane will never be found for that reason alone. No, I mean, I, I, I think that what you're saying is is probably most people's assumption. They think the plane wasn't found because the ocean is big. Right. Um, I think that's wrong. I think that's wrong. The, 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 the plane generated signals by a known process, and that known process has a known margin of error. So they were able to calculate a pretty precise um, probability map of where the plane could have gone. It wasn't just somewhere in the ocean. It was in a very specific area of the ocean that they were then able to scan and photographic detail. So the absence of this of the plane from the seabed is more mysterious than your intuition is telling you. Okay. I've just seen a, an interesting comment um, from John Lies. He's mentioned, um, actually, I don't forgot, got the wrong one there. Somebody mentioned previously that uh, an oil worker had perhaps seen an explosion over right. the sea. Is that something you're familiar with? Is that something that's been chased? Up? What do you know about that? I'm very familiar with that. There's all kinds of claims, uh, eyewitness accounts. I would say that when it comes to accident investigations, eyewitness accounts are notoriously unreliable. They 
tend to add really nothing to the um, you know the search for answers, and they tend to lead the public astray. Um, you get, I mean, it, it, it's a it's a common and, and and frustrating phenomenon. But yes, there's this this claim is is I would say groundless. I mean, how much difference would it make to the algorithms in, in looking for the wreckage if, for instance, the plane had broke up before impact for some reason we've yet to understand versus, you know, uh, the whole whole fuselage? Yeah, I mean, there have been some um, kind of self-described experts who have looked at pieces of debris and said, oh, this the, 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 the debris must have been damaged in a certain way. That means that the pilot was trying to, say, ditch it at low speed rather than high speed. I don't think it really matters. Um, what we do know is that if the data is uncorrupted, as theory one would have it, then we know pretty much that the plane was descending at a fast and accelerating rate uh, when it sent it la its last signal. So it was really nose diving towards the ocean. It's, it's still possible that for some reason, the pilot might have put it into a nose dive and then pulled it out and like tried to glide it. But again, what you have is like a really kind of bizarre sequence of events that that you're in, incurring, that you're invoking rather, just for the sake of trying to make your scenario fit the data. Um, okay. the, the, the authorities, for, for what it's worth, the authorities believe that this Inmarsat data, which shows that the plane was in a steep and accelerating dive, means that the plane had to hit the ocean very close to its final signal. Okay, so I mean, when this first was reported and, and it hit the news and people were theorizing what may have happened long before they started pointing the finger at the pilot, there was this idea of a sort of catastrophic failure in terms of pressurization in the cabin and the cockpit, uh, which could explain why the plane appeared to be aimlessly drifting for several hours. Is that something that you think is possible or have you since realized there's good reasons to dismiss this? That was looked at very seriously in the beginning and it was discarded pretty quickly, mainly because the plane was maneuvering. Um, you know, when the plane turned back, a lot of people were like, oh, it turned back because it had an emergency and it was gonna try to land, but it didn't try to land. It actually accelerated and climbed and maneuvered. It did all these things that it could. There are cases in history like the Helios or the Payne Stewart incident where planes depressurized or had some kind of a problem and then they just kept flying straight until they ran out of fuel. This ha it's kind of like a ghost flight and it's creepy, but the, the this kind of signature characteristic of them is that they go straight until they run out of fuel. Obviously that wasn't at all what happened with this one. And it so certainly, certainly wouldn't explain the reboot of the, SD, of the SDU. Okay, so I mean, the, the, these um, incidents, these maneuvering, the uh, man manipulation of certain instruments, things like that indicate that someone's yeah conscious and in control of what they're doing essentially what best explains these actions in your mind then in terms of what they were intending to do well the fact that there was a vulnerability um and that the plane behaved in a very strange way the fact that um the plane was not found on the southern seabed to me all add to the balance of a hijack scenario that, that MH370 was hijacked um, and it was flown to Kazakhstan. People, I know people are gonna get upset about that, um, but that frankly to me is the only way to explain things like um, the, the SD reboot and the absence of the wreckage from the seabed. People will say, well, what do you found all this? We found all this debris in the, in the east, in the Western Indian Ocean. That's true. Um, the biggest piece was found was the flap on. 15 months after the plane disappeared. Um, and I find it very very interesting, let's say, that the marine life that was found growing on this flap run was only a month or two old. Um, the plane had been in, this, the piece had supposedly been in the water for 15 months. And I've spent a lot of time talking to marine biologists who study the phenomenon of what's called marine fouling, this growth of organisms on things in water. If you're in the the shipping business, um, or if you're like in the Coast Guard and you have to maintain buoys, the problem of organisms growing on floating things is a big, big problem. So a lot of attention has been paid for. We know a lot about how, how organisms grow on floating objects. It's, nobody had really has a good explanation of how it could possibly be the case that an object in the water for 15 months has marine life on it that's only a month or two old. Is it is it possible, perhaps, then? So obviously you've you've floated this idea of the, the Kazakhstan hijack scenario, and you floated yeah. that, I think, I believe you floated that long before the wreck, some of the wreckage turned up. 
And now I mean, I was researching it before MH17. I had I had hired researchers in Russia and Ukraine before MH17 was even shot down in July of 2014. Great. And, and so now this wreckage turns up, and this is a big inconvenience to one of your theories, really. And rather than just sort of adjust and think maybe my original theory about the hijack didn't happen, to some it might be perceived that you're moving the goalposts slightly or, you know, doing a, a version of God of the Gaps uh, with this new piece of information by looking at marine biology, which maybe perhaps some people could explain why these only, uh, you know, organisms that appear to be a month old on, on a 15-month-old piece of wreckage. Is it possible that... You, you are clinging very closely to this one theory in despite of physical evidence? I mean, I think it's very easy to, 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 to think about emotional attachment to theories and to say, oh, you love your theory. Look, I think the job, the, what, what we have to do is take a hypothesis, stress test it, see what the evidence is, see what evidence is for it, see what evidence is against it. If there's evidence that is like clearly rules it out entirely, like if someone came forward and said, look, we have the Calcutta radar data for that time in question, we see other airplanes crossing their field and we don't see MH370. If, if MH370 can be shown to not have crossed the Calcutta um, IFR, then I think my theory is really out the window. Um, but I would point out that nobody has come forward for all the for all the derision and ridicule that my theory has gotten. Nobody has come out with anything that's really rolled out. And you might say, oh, but there's this debris. I mean, listen, I will say this. It's infinitely easier to plant debris than it is to carry out the kind of sophisticated hacking attack that I'm proposing. It's not hard to put stuff in the water. And frankly, I think that the fact that this marine life is so young is actually favors the hacking theory more than the pilot theory. It's a big problem. Again, it's like you could talk about the God of gaps. Yeah, we, we need to not just paper over evidence that isn't in our in the favor of a particular hypothesis. But at the same time, you know, we, we, you shouldn't just too quickly say, oh, this thing happened. Therefore, the only explanation is that this other thing happened. We have to keep an open mind. I mean, I feel like if if Look, we have a major problem. And as I'm constantly invoking what they say in 12 step, which is the first step to recovery is admitting that you have a problem. And MA370 has a huge problem. The authorities were extremely confident that they knew where the plane went and it wasn't there. This is too important of a problem to just say, oh, well, they did their best. This other thing sounds crazy. Let's ignore it. We have to, at this point, we have to roll up our sleeves. We have to say, okay, every, look, whatever happened to this plane, was crazy. It was a strange, strange tale. At this point, even can you still hear me? My headphones just made I, a funny noise. I can hear you, Jeff. But I think unfortunately we've just run out of time, and this has been a fascinating conversation. And I, I sincerely hope we all get the answers we're looking for on this one. And maybe in the, in a few minutes or so, a few seconds rather, we've got left. You can just tell our audience where they can find more of your your writing and an output on this topic. Uh, I have a website called jeffwise.net. And to your last thing, I will say we will not find it unless the authorities are willing to say that maybe they were wrong in their assumptions and maybe they weren't just unlucky, maybe they actually made a mistake. So uh, jeffwise.net, um, my Twitter handle is uh, at manvbrain. Um, and yeah, if you have questions, reach out to me. I, I love answering questions from people. Jeff, it's been a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. All the best. Chet Sandu's book is finally available worldwide on Amazon. He's one of our most viral podcast guests ever. The book is called Self Made, Juice Paid, an Asian kid who became an international drug smuggling gangster. Do you want to read some of the back, Jen? Yeah, go the blurb. In 1999, Chet Sandu was arrested at gunpoint in Alicante Airport for smuggling the largest quantity of illicit pharmaceutical drugs in Spanish history. Interesting. Overnight, he went from living in the shadows of the Costa del Crimes underworld to being labelled a notorious supervillain in the international press. Incarcerated alongside murderers, rapists and terrorists in a super maximum security wing. He had to navigate a world of murderous knife fights, prison breaks, drug taking and high stake power plays. 
good bedtime read. In Self Made Jews Paid Learn, how a British born Asian kid with disabilities raised in a corner shop emerged as a protector of his family from racist thieves and hooligans. Be prepared to be entertained, informed and offended by Chet's no holes barred account of raves, drugs, bodybuilding, entering the fashion industry. Did you know that he dated Kylie Minogue and Naomi yes. Campbell? <laughs> latest interview. Working the doors and life in one of the world's deadliest places to be incarcerated. If you enjoyed Chet's podcast series with us, there's a lot more detail in the book. Check it out. Worldwide on Amazon, ebook, paperback, and audiobook.